Hi, welcome back to another episode of the Modern Patient Experience with Q Squareds. I'm your host, James Furbush. My guest this week, he might not need an introduction, but we'll give him one anyways, because he's earned it. He is the former CEO and founder of Athena Health and the current founder and CEO of Zeus Health, John Bush. John, welcome to the show this week. Very excited to have you on. James, it's great to see your face again after lo these many years. So for those who don't know, again, I used to was a former Athenista myself. And had many a scary moments going up to John Bush's corner office to make him look good on LinkedIn. So, John, thanks again so much for, for making the time. You know, I wanted to start for you. You know, you know, I'm always curious how busy executives such as yourself, what you do to sort of recharge your batteries and make sure that you're not getting burnt out. I know that's kind of a big, you know, work professional topic these days for, for people. But, you know, I'm always curious for you what you do to sort of stay fresh and, and recharge. Well, I find work to be very recharging. So I, I don't know which, you know, maybe it's more like to balance family life with something else. I think of work as an incredible antidote for taking care of children and taking care of children is a pretty damn good antidote for work. As long as you weren't taking care of children at work that day. But I think that recharging is more like getting psychic distance from any one thing so that you have that chance to be dumb and open at, at something. Yeah. As a parent myself, my wife and I, we often joke, I don't know what I look forward to more, like Friday afternoon or like Monday morning. It, sometimes it's probably one until cool. you've had a little of the other and then, you know, you're back. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and I find that to taking on, you know, things, being new at things, not to scare your listeners, but I'm an amateur pilot and that, you know, uses a whole set of brain cells that don't really get used in any other pursuit. And so after I just flew my family up from New York, my oldest two kids live in the city, work in the city and, uh, you know, flew the babies and my wife up. And when I landed, I had had literally nothing other than air traffic control gibberish in my brain for an hour. And it was like it had my head had tripled in size because it just had shut off all the chatter of everything else. So, so I'm sure flying is probably a very mindful activity in some ways. Fine, but very narrow. And so, you know, all the, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, are we building, we're being too prescriptive with Zeus builders. Are we, you know, being too prescriptive with org design? Are we, you know, getting enough done? Are we working hard enough? You know, all these, these threads just get shut off completely. And it's also helpful, I think, for some people to have, you know, life and death it does enforce mental discipline. So, so something either being at sea or in the sky or Doing something where even riding a bike in traffic really helps clear out that that chatter. Love it. I love it. Well, that's great. So Zeus Health is an interesting moment in time for an interesting company, what you are trying to do at Zeus. But I'd love to hear more. I don't want to, you know, reduce it. You know, you guys are essentially it's like an infrastructure. You're building developer tools for yeah. healthcare specific digital health companies. I mean, tell me what you're. That was well, you, you've been to the website. God bless you, James. Yeah. That, at Athena, we had more disruption, please. Remember that? The MD sure. program. And it was all these companies with adjacent offerings, you know, maybe like you, you know, this, this thing that would make a given function of a practice go better. Yeah. You know, why don't we text our freaking bills instead of send these ridiculous pieces of paper that no one reads? That concept opened my eyes to just how closed AthenaNet was to outside development. And, and, you know, I tried very hard to open it up. And, you know, one of the many great reasons for firing me was how much money I spent trying to open it up when I could have been shipping the profits. But that, you know, that idea of all these companies wanting to connect and engage in some way in collaborative products delivery kind of got me excited. And then watching over the course of the pandemic, this new flavor of company that sort of makes its own tech, but also delivers care, right? It doesn't. It doesn't sell tech to providers. It is a provider, but it also has a CTO and an engineering team and designers and they're designing workflows, apps and services. That concept of hybridizing the tech and the care into one animal really excited me, excites me. But I happen to know how long a putt it is to build a fully functional EHR. <laughs> and the idea of each one of these, you know, I do nothing but you know, irritable bowel syndrome, and I do it better than anyone. And I've got my own tech team and I've got my own dedicated coaches and GI docs. And, but anyway, like HIPAA freaking compliant 
meaningful use, freaking compliant prescription writing is just a lot of work. And it's not going to make us any more unique as a treater of irritable bowel than using someone else's. Whereas if I'm stuck, you know, frankly, using Athena net or Cerna or Epic or whatever, which is truly designed for an office-based encounter with a provider who's not building any tech, you know, that's tough too. And so I think the idea for Zeus was, what if we help these guys thread the needle? What if we pre-built a lot of the basic activities? Registration, like everybody's got to build patient registration, right? Prescribing or, or building a care plan. Like what's a care plan? Well, it's a bunch of tasks, okay? Building a task. You know, these things are common across the vast majority of these 8,000 new digital health companies that have come into being and gotten so much venture capital in the last couple of years that we could speed up the category, not just, you know, make a couple of great bets and, and win as an angel investor, as I was trying to do before, but actually speed up the whole digital health category if we could make those core utilities available to everyone. Super cheap, super good, you know, super performant. That's awesome. And so so these companies will come and sort of plug into Zeus and really if they just need to write like a front end or do something that's unique to their organization, but they they can't. Is that sort of, you know, can you walk through for your organizations that you're you're selling to? You know, they're getting like patient records. Is it sort of a soup to nuts? What does that sort of look like for them? So what it looks like is think of a library of if you've ever been on the Stripe website that there are these wonderful demos with these little video treatments of all the different ways you can just 500 ways to take a payment yeah right they've just crushed that one narrow category and this is an incredible company it's gonna be the i think it'd probably be the biggest ipo in the history of the world just doing that one thing so so well so so richly i don't know if we'll ever get to that level of richness but we will try to build out really rich treatments of the common activities that these companies have everybody's got to register a patient yeah. Everybody's got to, you know, do some kind of CRM, customer relationship management, messaging, texting, phone calling, whatever. Build out those common utilities so that it's easy to skip through that part of your build as a, as a company. The only other thing is uh, we believe that these companies have in common a, a value of plenty where data is concerned. So back at Athena, our clients really, you know, they would comply with the law and, and, and they conscientiously, you know, wanted to be good data citizens, but 0% of them wanted to share their records, you know, or not be in charge of their operational data. These companies are different. These companies actually, you know, have, have they are fractile. They, you know, one guy is doing only alcohol treatment. One guy is doing only opioid treatment, one guy's doing only primary care, one guy's only doing mental health. Those guys actually can do those narrow jobs better if they can get kind of AWACS, you know, overflight of what else is going on with these people. And so they actually selfishly do better with shared operational data. And so it's not just that they're trying to be a good citizen, they actually selfishly want it. And so the other characteristic about Zeus that I'm excited about is, as opposed to having many, 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 many copies of each patient, as we did at Athena, we can have one. Well, we can be Spotify, right? Steve Jobs was, was not wrong about a lot of things, but I think he was wrong that everybody wanted to own and keep their own little set of songs, you know, <laughs> because it just became so convenient to be able to just, instead of having a database in your hand, as, as we did in our early iPod days, right? Just have a lens in our hand that points at a single list of every song ever sung. Right, as we now do in our Spotify days. I think that is true of medicine as well. It's fascinating to me how quickly that shift has happened, at least like from uh, not owning music or not owning mu movies. I mean, it was not that long ago where, where, you know, you did, right? You wanted to have your music collection. You wanted to have a thousand, a thousand DVDs, right? And, and right. now it's like, no, I don't want any of that stuff. I literally just want to pay someone to give me access to all of that yeah. material that I can. I've got so much plenty. What I really want to do is pay someone to tell me what to listen to next. Right. It's all there now and it's all correlated and linked. And oh my God. The ship too, I think about this with, with like, you know, go back to parenting with my daughter where that's the only world that she knows. Right. You know what I mean? Like they, they just, it's, it's just such a different user, you know, paradigm for lack of a, a good way to, to, to put it. But it, I think it's good because it, it hasn't yet happened in healthcare. We still hear about this, right? I mean, 
you, know, you talk to any CEOs and, and things of, of delivery companies and come and deliver providers and, and they're like, yeah, we still have interoperability challenges, like different systems. Sure. We can't even. Um, the very notion of interoperability as opposed to, you know, shared use is, is just a, it's a different paradigm. People, people who say the word interoperability have as a first principle that there's going to be two copies of something. Right. Right. And we're going to interoperate, right? There's a new paradigm here that a new generation of company and person, to your point, there are some of us that were actually born into this model. LinkedIn was the only resume some of us ever had. Not me. I had Microsoft Word, you know. Oh. So what did you know? I've updated my resume, you know, click link, you know, share, you know, not share email, attach email yeah. one by one to each person. It's a migration that's going on. It sort of makes sense that as society, we practiced in areas of low consequence with an average younger age of consumer, more flexible, more plain plasticity, less etched, you know, in, in habit. Uh, and now we're kind of creeping up on more socially critical, more financially relevant applications of platform thinking. Yeah. And so, you know, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts. So you kind of touched upon this a little bit, but sort of the difference between the digital health companies now that you're seeing where it's they're thinking about not just delivering tools, but delivering care, or delivering a service or delivering something just beyond here is a tool you can use. But I'd love to hear, can you kind of expand upon that? Like, what are the changes in, in, in sort of the, the newer digital health companies that you know, VC money are, is getting poured into, right? Like left and right over the last two years, it's been insane. But I'd love to see how you're seeing how that, that difference and that evolution and what that means for patients ultimately. Yeah. Well, we, we've we seen the migration of information products, you know, where you have, a, you know, a rare and expensive core thing that a small number of people can pay a lot to get. And then little by little by little, we build storage and distribution mechanisms that make it available sort of out at the periphery, you know, more cheaply, ever more cheaply. And, uh, you know, compute in general, you know, from only getting a reservation at a university with a grant to use computer time by the hour to all of us carrying more compute than the biggest craze supercomputer of 1997 ever dreamed of having round in our pocket to the same thing with information products. I mean, with the Google or Amazon, the amount of search and guidance that we could get that would have taken years and years and years of librarian work at, you know, in the offline world, we're doing in minutes for free on the speculation that either our eyeballs for advertisers or our eyeballs for product sales will justify the effort, right? So we're used to getting tons of shit for free, not really free, we're our time and our and our buying behaviors has been calculated in. So maybe call it included, you know, as opposed to free. That's a concept we're used to outside of healthcare. And I believe it's one that we'll see in healthcare. I believe people will be quite used to getting their primary care questions asked, answered for free or included, as it were, in real time or near real time all the time. And then It'll be made up for by savings against the premium and reductions in hospital use and other expensive, you know, supercomputer time to carry the metaphor forward and beat it to death. It's funny because I think about sometimes like our experience in regular life. And it's a little bit like sometimes I come back to retail where like at this point, you know, your retail experience, maybe it's brick and mortar, maybe it's digital, but either way, you know, if you're a Warby Parker customer. Yep. Like sometimes you pop into the store and sometimes you don't. And yet in healthcare, it's still like this notion of like telehealth or digital health. Yeah. It's still this sort of like weird siloed. You, Warby Park is a great metaphor. I, I'm on the board of Firefly Health, right? They, all their care is virtual first, but not all their care is virtual, right? Sometimes you need to, somebody's got to palpate your abdomen or, you know, give you a stress culture, a strep culture or take an x-ray, right? And so. You know, what Firefly has been doing is going to urgent care centers and doctor's offices and hospital systems and saying, hey, can you be our Warby Parker outlet? You know, can, can we can we drop in and rent five minutes of someone's time to check the abdomen or do a strep culture? We'll pay, you know, full price for it. 
but we only want that. You know, we don't want the workup and the malpractice and the coding and the billing and the EOBs. We just want you to do the abdomen with us online and put the answer in and we'll give you 50 bucks, you know, and you sort of hybridize and take that, that physical plant and make it, you know, much more rarely used, less of the guts of the information product there. And it's more just a tactile endpoint. Yeah, it's kind of a win, win, win. For the early adopters, it's a win, win. I mean, someday someone's going to be left with a lot of physical plant without a, you know, without a lot of patients. <laughs> But in the early days, those who choose this end up with a lot more patient visits. Well, think about like unused capacity for for physical locations if they if they have it. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's the equivalent yeah. of Airbnb, right? You know, you're renting out your unused Excellent capacity you got or yep. ghost kitchens, right? That all you got to do is prove to that provider that that owner of physical plants that the volume you're going to bring in is not cannibalized volume. It's not volume that you're taking away from them. It's incremental volume to whatever their business has. And it's like, well, shit, yeah, why not? It's like the early Uber driver, right? Some right. Austin coach driver driving along. It's like, I got to usually spend three hours at the airport for free rides, but then I get a $300 ride, right? This app is telling me that if I take one of those three hours and whip somebody home, you know, into the city and back, I'll get an extra 50 bucks. It's 50 bucks I wouldn't have had. I'm not losing my other ride. And little by little by little, these guys are like, shit, maybe I'll just keep doing this. There's the same type of possibility in medicine as more and more care is connected. How would you advise incumbents, right? So like your typical, you know, delivery system, what do you advise them to start thinking about this, right? I mean, because this, I feel like this is... I think you did it. I think your advice, I think Warby Parker is a metaphor that, you know, you should think about. If you've got bricks, you know, make them the front end do a very big brain, a bigger brain than whatever brain you can support with a local geographic monopoly, you know, start thinking of care as a national product and then rethink what you need your bricks for in a national information. product. Yeah. I mean, and so, and you need, a lot. you need surgery, I mean, you know, a common surgery isn't worth flying across the country for, right. It's worth doing in that local set of bricks, you know, a very rare surgery, which is only done maybe a couple thousand times a year nationally. It's better not to do it there, right? The brain is going to say, no, no, we're not, we're not sending someone for a, you know, septal defect repair, you know, some baby, you know, to a local community hospital. We're going to send them to Children's or CHOP or, you know, one or two places. And then we'll go to Children and CHOP, say, look, we're flying this in. You don't, you don't have this in your monopoly sphere. We're flying this in, so make us an offer. And it suddenly returns, for, at least for a little while, the demand curve to medicine. Yeah. Uh, so fascinating. What, um, you know, the role of government do they play in sort of enabling digital health companies and, and making this move? Right. Cause we know they move. Well, I think underlying all of this is, is liberation of the data that the government, you know, paid for most of, right. I mean, most of the, most of the dollars spent on third party paid medicine or government dollars, either through the fact that it's pre-tax or the fact that it's Medicare or the fact that it's Medicaid. And so the government has said, and it's it's actually one of the very few areas that appears to be bipartisan, is, yeah, it, we bought this shit. You got to share it. The patient wants it. You got to make it available. And that liberation of data, first with HIPAA, which is now in pretty common use, providers, you know, can go get, albeit a shitty, hard to read PDF type yeah. image of a patient's continuity of care document, they can get one. And similarly, soon, maybe, patients will be able to. They'll be able to do whatever the government authorized login dance is and say, give me all my machine readable, give me all my data, give it to me in machine readable format and always keep giving it to me or to my, to Zeus or to, you know, my Firefly primary care or whatever it is. And, and as that happens, it'll be easier and easier and easier, easier to build data rich products on that, on that foundation. So in this particular instance, it seems that government is, at least for now, on the side of the angels. I mean, when hospitals start to close because we use half as many emergency room visits, you know, maybe the government, the, the congressmen who have all those votes, you know, may, may find a way to, you know, often their support a little. But uh, so far, it's pretty bipartisan. Yeah, I mean, well, it's important. So for, for you, for Zeus, I mean, it, that, that would benefit you guys too, right? If we We would like to be, you know, 
the official water boy for all those teams. You know, we want to, we want to be the go-getter and the storer and the sharing, the sharing engine for all of that newly liberated data. Yeah, that's, that's so great. So, you know, I'm, I'm curious too, so, you know, not to go back to, to Steve Jobs a little bit, but one of the things I always think that few people talk about, but is one of maybe the most interesting stories about his life is sort of his time between when he left Apple and when he returned to Apple and he sort of became a different CEO. And so I'm, I'm curious for you, you know, what have you sort of learned or, or can you kind of talk about a little bit of the journey that you were on between when you sure. sort of left Athena to... We'll start by saying that I'm, in case I had any doubt, I'm no Steve Jobs. Well, yeah, and I don't want to like inflate your ego anymore. I think a theory of plenty comes to mind when you when you kind of get some space and realize there's so much to do. More liberal about what you assign and let people own instead of worrying about making sure it's done right, I think is a is a thing that I've changed. Do do less, want more. <laughs> to bring it back to your first question, context shift. Don't grind away. Get out and fly or really, really focus on changing a diaper or do something to pull your focus out. And then when you come back and look at it, it looks different. I think thinking about the problem rather than thinking about the business and let all these wonderful young rock stars come and think about the business is a wonderful luxury of kind of second mountain life. A higher great talent. I mean, you hired great talent at Athena too. Yep. Yeah, we, we have extraordinary talent at Zeus. It's really mind-blowing. We did it at the, it's harder to keep the same bar among 5,500 people sure. among 50. But the work of, I think, a, of a CEO is the setting up of the challenge. You know, Sun Tzu said the art of war is deciding where to fight, not how to fight and win. Setting up a problem that's really inspiring to inspiring people and getting, getting some one version of it, getting sort of the first cell division to happen in pursuit of that problem. It's really exciting. It's really hard and it's really rewarding. It's where most of the value in the world is created. And so figuring out how to keep my energy focused on that has been a, a, a great the area of progress that came only with being, you know, really, really well and truly fired. Why does the problem of healthcare data drive you? Because it was a it was a quest at Athena, and you sort of come back a second time to solve it in a different way that you were maybe unable to solve it at Athena. In I, you know, it's funny because I don't actually think the data inside of hospital systems and medical offices is that great, right? It's really it's it's job to do is to justify a particular procedure code being used on a claim and maybe to defend against a, a very unlikely case of a malpractice claim. That's really the job to do. Maybe be a little bit if there's a lot of repeat visits of reminding the doctor where, you know, she or he is in the, in the care journey with someone. I think that the data that will be born, the Zeus platform that will be generated from the text logs and IOT feeds of the digital health generation will be vastly more powerful and useful. But I think the very notion that whether regardless of how good the data is, that we start again with it every time is just Kafka-esque. I mean, it's just absurd. Let's have stories, even though most of us aren't sick most of the time. We still all have these incredible stories of starting all over again with a freaking clipboard. Are you kidding me? And not having that be attached to something that knows a little better. That idea is something when combined with what percentage of our economy is taken from us by force for the purpose of covering us just creates a lot of rage. And it doesn't have to be that way. It's an absolutely soluble problem. So I think that's what draws me to it. It's like everybody agrees on how much this sucks. Like everyone, and everyone knows how much money would be freed up for other uses, maybe more healthcare uses, who knows, but not doing this bureaucratic Soviet era forms bullshit right that's just exciting you know it's like what a boil you know you see a boil you know that on tiktok the pimple popping yeah 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 it's all these people just can't get enough i think the greatest freaking boil ever lanced would be if we eliminated the clipboard from medicine the the continued use of paper i mean the clipboards yeah 
the yeah, same clean up the same same intake, starting with bed on who am I and what disease, and I'm, you know, oh my god, just I, I mean that reliance on physical paper is for everything. It's like, dude, it's it's 2020. Like, what year are we living in? Like, oh my god, it's, it's awful. Well, John, thank you so much for catching up and letting us know what you're up to at Zeus. I thank you for your time. This has been enlightening and, and wonderful as always. And so thank you so much. Well, it's nice to see that you're hale and hearty and doing good things, James. I hope we meet a lot more. So real quick uh, for listeners, if they want to learn more about Zeus, where should they go? Zeus.health. Check it out. We need you. John, thanks so much. Appreciate your time.